My hammer burns with holy fire. Ancestral Recall set a new high today. $165 for a beta Ancestral Recall. And I tell you what, just as a courtesy, just as a courtesy for me to everybody out there, 2017 Wolverine Rudy, I will pay everybody face value. Not 80 cents on the dollar, not TCG mid, I will pay everybody face value for Ancestral Recall at the full price of $165 a card, which is the absolute perfect price of March 1998. So, just want to let everybody know. Because this video is actually about a follow-up because everyone's been asking me, Rudy, you just did a big rant about dual decks being shitty. About dual decks not going up. And guess what happened? Dual decks went up. LOL. Where's an LOL cat when you need one? If that is not the biggest LOL, that's irony, if you ask me. So... I made a video about dual decks, what, a couple weeks ago? And I was talking about how they used to be these glorious things and they're powerful cards and then wizards avoided putting powerful cards in dual decks and now everybody's like, ah, dual decks suck, ah, dual decks give me the creeps, ah, ah, y you know, that kind of shit, you know? So, Nissa says, you know what, I'm gonna be a badass chick, watch this. So Nissa decides to take out a life of her own. And Nissa decides, you know what, after this, I'm not going to be 5 bucks, I'm going to 13 So, as of the filming this video, I think like TCG mid, eBay lowest price is like 13 14 for Nissa. Nissa. I like Nissa better. I don't know why. I wish she was called Nissa instead of Nissa. Anyway, so, everybody wants to know. Rudy, can you believe the price spike? Are you going to sell the dual decks? I know you have hundreds. We saw in the other video, you got piled. You got stacked. Are you, are you finally going to sell the things? What are you going to do? Are you going to sleep with them? Are you going to sell them? Are you going to fondle them? What are you going to do? Are you going to ship them out to Creepy Rudy? I don't know what we're going to do. So, the dual decks are only like 15 bucks. Buy it now. Free shipping on eBay. Because of the Nissa price spike, I think they moved like 20 You know, the actual sealed product really hasn't had a big move up. Surprisingly, it really hasn't. You would think it would. But the problem is, again, there's still so many out there. So, for store owners and people out there, you're now faced with a dilemma that I think a lot of people would like to hear my thought process on how I break down the numbers and how I handle a situation that's like this. And the situation is, okay, you bought a couple hundred dual decks. You got in at $9, and what I pay, $9.90 from the other video? I can't remember. I paid 10 bucks. Let's round up. I paid 10 bucks a dual deck. You now have one card in the entire dual deck that's selling for 13 That nice, pretty little green chick there that says, yeah, I'm hot. And uh, took you all long enough to realize it, and I'm a badass chick. And uh, you know you want me. That's kind of right. I do want it. So the thing is, now that that's happened, I have to decide what do I want to do. There's, the, there's two main parts to all this shit about dealing with magic, sealed product. If you're just a store trying to move inventory, turn everything over every 30 days, invest in the product. No matter what direction you're trying to take, unless you're just a hands-down player, hands down, there's the first one in the video. You need to figure out what do you do when the price goes up. Once you establish a low-cost basis and entry point, the toughest part moving forward is when you get out. It's no different than every other investment out there. There are so many people out there that would buy, you know, Apple stock in the 70s and 80s. And everyone's like, Rudy, man, you should have bought Apple stock back in the 80s. It was like a dollar, two dollars a share. You know, people can't do that because that was dead money for years. And you can't predict the future. There is no way to predict the future. And that, that's why, okay, that's why, for example, I have Celestial Prism in this video. This is an old-ass alpha card that literally I think everybody, hands down, 
feel like I always gotta use that now. I'm like cursed with it. Everybody thinks it's the worst magic artwork ever. And I don't think that's the case, but I think this card has a lot of symbolism and it's one of my favorite Alpha 10s. And it's not worth a lot. It's an Alpha 10. It's an uncommon. I'm sure there's a population report of maybe five or six out there. I don't know. Maybe ten now. Who knows? The purpose, though, of me showing you Celestial Prism in this video is it proves that a simplistic, basic, easy, basic art on a card, it really is not about that. It's about perspective. That card is a prism. It breaks down something into something different. Or it breaks something. A prism, especially that card, you put light through it, you break it down, it looks different. It's no different than a lot of things in this world. And that pretty much summarizes how I feel about the dual deck situation, how I feel about when things go good or bad. And in this video, when we got the hot chick Nissa trying to be all badass, we have to determine, okay, if you've got a couple hundred of these, now how do you move forward? What do we do? Well, I've been thinking about it, and I've been trying to decide the best course of action. I think as of right now, I'm actually going to possibly crack about a hundred of these, and I'm going to part it out in singles, between local and just straight up on eBay. Hands down, that's what we're going to do. And the reason for that is because I now have one card. And keep in mind, by the way, this is still, if I recall from the other video, not only do you have Mr. Ob in this package, but you also have Crop Rotation. Well, there's some other good cards in this. I, I didn't look it up before filming, but there's actually quite a few handful of cards, and there's a lot of random uncommons and rares that are also inside that dual deck that sell for like a dollar a piece or, buy, or 99 cents for one, or a four pack for four dollars on eBay. There's a lot of value. In my opinion, based on the current situation, I think I can probably get, probably gross, not net, gross probably about $30 a dual deck at this point. I think with the strong pricing, I think it'd be very easy to bring in $30 for a $10 cost basis. So the question is, do you just take off? What I'm going to do, there's not going to be a question. I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do at this point. I'm probably going to open 100 of them. I'm going to pretty much sell Nissa by herself and net probably $11. And that's going to pay for 100 units of the dual deck. And still give me a 10% return. So if I net 11 I paid 10 I'm already up 10% and I have an entire two decks of cards with a ton of other cards that are worth a dollar a piece, four for a dollar, two, three dollar cards. And that's a pretty good position to be in because right now, the fact that there's still so many sealed ones out there, no matter how crazy 2017 Wolverine hairstyle Rudy is, you know, Creepy Rudy just says, nah, bro, there's so much of that shit out there, it's going to be hard for the product to actually go up. It's already gone up. Don't get me wrong. These were only like $15 shipped on eBay. And now they're up to about maybe 20 I mean, that you're looking at 20 30% increase. But considering there's now single cards in here and my personal valuation, probably up to around $30 a unit, to me, there's no point in selling them sealed right now. The market is out of balance, and it could be because it's just that. Whenever you have single cards substantially higher than the sealed product, you're going to have arbitrage. And the single cards are either going to come back down or the sealed product's going to have to push higher, one or the other. Because if the single cards stay expensive, people like me can go out there and just start buying up everybody else's and break them down and just start dumping the cards and making money. You know, that's pretty much what happens when the market is out of balance and there's an easy opportunity for arbitrage. And stores do that kind of shit all the time. I'm talking all the time. As much as you guys stare at the greed monster in the background, that's how often stores think about every little penny and every little way to make that penny. That's how frequent it is, you know? So I, I really kind of wanted to just break that down because I don't know if the price is going to hold. My instinct says that I do think the price increase on a lot of these cards and what's going on. I mean, I think even, uh, what was it? What was the other one? I think uh, Narset is actually on the move too. You have a lot of these mythics. You have a lot of, especially the mythics. And even some rares, but a lot of planeswalkers and cards that are going up because of the infinite combos and different things with Aether Revolt. And on top of that... Again, it does appear Frontier is a real thing, and it appears that it might be here to stay. It might not be a flash in the pan. It might not just be like, hey, look at this Rudy guy. This, this, look at this idiot on the YouTube. He makes like this goofy video. He's probably going to be gone, and no one's going to give a shit by tomorrow. But most likely, he's still going to be around. And that's the thing. You don't really know until time unfolds. You can't predict all this stuff. 
and everyone just, oh my god, Rudy made that video bashing Dual Deck, and he has like hundreds of them, and he's like, oh, what is he going to do with them? And now all of a sudden, I'm like, hell, look at that. It, it's like what we like to call in the industry, it's like lightning in a bottle. And that was kind of one of those things where when you work in a company, and you just show up some days, and something good happens, and you really didn't do anything, and everyone's like, oh, Rudy, great job today, way to hit the numbers, oh, you're such a badass. And you're like, yeah, hell yeah. You really didn't do shit. You just showed up, you sat down, you pretended to work for an hour, you snuck in through the back door, and you're playing Tetris on your computer, and you're getting credit. That's lightning in a bottle. And this is a perfect example of what I like to call a lightning in a bottle situation. It's Rudy being diversified in a shit ton of sealed product, and just sitting back and waiting. And what happened? The last 48 hours? Well, something happened. I didn't see it coming. And that's another thing. People always say, well, Ruby, how can you better predict? How can you tell when, when something's going to happen? Can, can we really figure out a pattern? No, you can't. Stop trying to act like you know what cards are going to go up or down. Some people are really good at it, and I'm not going to use the term luck because versus skill. I don't want to get into that argument, but there's so many variables between the moves that Wizards was going to make, the moves the public was going to make, reprints, and pretty much the overall strength of the secondary, there's there's too many moving parts. It is Some people say, hey, look at my track record. I did those last two things and I was right. And that may be the case, but at the end of the day, there is no way to have a consistent, long-term success track record predicting this stuff. I can't do it. And I've been doing this shit since 93, 94. And I can't do I don't have a clue. Even on sealed product, it is still almost impossible for me to try to figure out a way to say, okay, don't buy any cons booster boxes. We're going to put all our money in Fate Rewards boxes. This is going to be the future. And, you know, and that could be the case. That, that wasn't the decision I went with. I thought I went with, obviously, as everybody knows, I went with cons as being the booster boxes of the future for right now. And I could be wrong. You know, it could end up being fate. It could have been the Eternal Masters, and I could have been wrong. But at the end of the time, you have to just kind of go with what your instinct says. And for me, you know, this was a lightning in the bottle situation, especially the timing that I made the video bashing dual decks, how much I love dual decks, and how much I hate the fact that they just don't do anything anymore. There's no demand for them anymore. You know, everyone's just like, oh, look, hey, here's just a... It's a nice dual deck you got there. Maybe you'll come in and work with Lumberg on Sunday. You know, nobody cares about dual decks. It's a sad thing. And here we are. You know, something positive happened with the dual deck. So, that's all I really have to say about the dual deck. I really wanted to make a little quick short video discussing kind of this whole situation. And for me, I'm not really going to dump the whole position. Like I said, I'm going to break some down. And I am going to sell some singles because I'm going to lock in the profit. But with what's going on with this Frontier and a lot of these price spikes on newer cards, not price spikes on reserve list buyouts, but actual newer cards, it, it does appear that, you know, the Frontier thing is causing ripple effects and it appears to be the real deal. So, I mean, you know, if the trend is your friend and that's the trend of what's going on, well, we better ride it because that's where we're going. Giggity. So, I mean, you know, if that's what everybody wants, then we're going to ride that direction and we're going to enjoy it. We don't know how long it's going to be. It's no different than a lot of other card games. You don't know if it's going to be sustainable or not. Um, for right now, you can definitely see everything that's frontier legal definitely seems to be uh, definitely seems to be being targeted. And I don't know if it's a bunch of companies going after the greed monster. I don't know if it's a bunch of people speculating, but there's definitely movement in frontier related frontier legal cards and all everything newer than you know the M15 card frame, which was the cutoff. So. I, I'm not really sure. The only time going to tell them that stuff. So, it's really with Alpha Investments. That's all I really have to say. So, if you want to pick up some of these on eBay, for find whoever's got the cheapest. Uh, I don't think I even have any for sale on eBay, but I would go on eBay, hit sort by cheapest, buy it now, and see if you can find some for 15 16 that may pop up. It's a really good deal at this point because you have literally $30 worth of single cards for around $15 $16 sealed product. I don't know how long that market's going to stay in balance, but you guys like to play or if you're trying to build a frontier deck that's probably going to be something that you know it's it's a good position to make money and increase the value of your collection by not spending a lot of money so that's really all i have to say um as far as patreon um i did want to make a quick comment before i end the video i'm working on a deal right now for february um if that deal goes through 50 50 chance it's kind of reminded of you guys of the commander month from november 
Uh, remember I was trying to do Call of Dash, everybody wanted that for November, and then the Commander thing worked out, everybody was like, what? He's not doing Call of Dash, and we did Commander, and everybody loved it. Um, we're working on something, a different situation. Um, the deal has not been finalized as of the filming of this video, but if it does go through, obviously um, we're going to be doing that booster box for next for February 1st. Uh, if it doesn't, obviously everybody knows. I will go ahead and place my first order and probably do Aether Revolt. Um, I haven't ordered any Aether Revolt yet. Obviously, as you guys know, I did a couple boxes. That was very thankful for those other stores across the country. But when I do order Aether Revolt, it's probably going to be in February. Or it might be March, like I said, if I can get the deal to go through. I actually really want this other set to go through. Um, and then we can just hold off on buying an Aether Revolt to see kind of how the set and the financial value holds up. But um, trust me, I think a lot of people will like it. Um, some people may not, I don't know, but I think the price point and if we can work everything out will be very exciting, you know, add a nice little surprise for a lot of people. So, and again, it's still a newer set, nothing crazy, but anyways, Rudy with Alpha Investments, tell me what you think below, comments. I don't know if you guys were me, if you would just open them all and dump the cards because something actually went up in value, that's new. I'm not sure if you just think I'm being greed monster and I shouldn't hold any of it. I don't know, to each their own, but again, all I have to say, it's no different than a role playing game. All role-playing games from everybody since the dawn of time, since Nintendo to PlayStation. Magic is no different than a role-playing game. Because you gotta sit, you gotta wait, you gotta be patient. All this stuff with collecting, investing. Magic the Gathering itself is a grind. It is a long-term process. It isn't a get-rich-overnight. It is a slow, gradual build. That's all I have to say. You guys have a splendid day. Tell me how nuts I am below. Bye. Aether Revolt is just days away from launch, and our focus now turns to the modern format. What cards will have an impact on modern, and what one card will see play in modern more than any other? For many Magic the Gathering players, their frustrations with standard have begun to push them into modern, while others migrate here from legacy out of concern that their format is dying? No, the reserve list is not quite Fatal? Well, stay tuned and be sure to wait all the way to the end of this top five list to find out that Fatal Push is the number one card to see impact and play in modern. I mean, which card? Which card will... Oh, ah! Darn it! Okay, so the number one card for modern is obviously Fatal Push, but... What card is number two? Stay tuned to the end to find out. But first, what makes Fatal Push the top of just everyone's list from Aether Revolt for cards likely to see play in Modern? Fatal Push cannot possibly be anything other than the top pick for Modern. For one black mana, it is an instant that reads, destroy target creature if it has converted mana cost two or less. Revolt, destroy that creature if it has converted mana cost four or less instead, if a permanent you controlled left the battlefield this turn. So let's talk about the modern format. It is, with a few exceptions, a fast format that heavily uses fetch lands and low CMC creatures. This is one reason why cards like Abrupt Decay and Eidolon of the Great Revel are so great in the format. The CMC restriction might make these fair cards for limited and standard, but in modern? Nearly everything has converted mana cost 3 or below, with a few key pieces at 4. With a fetch land, you can trigger revolt with ease, allowing for fast, effective, versatile, and flexible removal. In many instances, the early game can even have this card working wonders without revolt. The fact that it is an uncommon makes it all the more wonderful. Grab your playsets now. If nothing else, they make excellent trade fodder. Man, imagine if Fatal Push were a Friday Night Magic promo. So many people would come in to play Standard because of that card's relevance in Modern, and yet it would also be a Standard viable card from the recent set. Boy, Friday Night Magic attendance for Standard would be through the roof, and oh, hello, let's move on to Honorable Mentions now that we've covered the number one pick. 
In my top five list for Frontier from Aether Revolt, many viewers were dismayed that I only listed five cards from Aether Revolt and did not have any honorable mentions. So vocal were they in their frustration that I feel, for Modern, I need to comply with honorable mentions. And that's right, our honorable mention is Brawl, Chief of Compliance, and yes, that is the laziest segue in the entire history of Talarian Community College. And if you're a longtime viewer, then you know that's saying something. For all, Chief of Compliance costs one generic mana and one blue for a legendary human wizard that reads, instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. He also reads, whenever a spell or ability you control counters a spell, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. Oh, that loot effect. Oh, Baral, my boy, you are so close. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today we are doing some overclocking. Yes, that's right. The age-old topic that's been discussed and exhausted through and through, but we're going to talk about it again today. And there's a couple reasons why. The first of which is because I'm just curious to see how good this freaking video card is at overclocking and how fast it is, really. This is the Galax GTX 1070. This is their EXOC, or Extreme Overclock, which is very hard to get in the U.S., actually. I was only able to go to the Galax store. I had to go there and purchase it and have it shipped all the way from China or Taiwan or wherever it comes from. So it, it's not a very talked-about card. However, it is gorgeous. It's completely stunning, and it's supposed to be a pretty damn fast GPU in terms of GTX 1070 speed. So today we're going to be overclocking that as well as the Core i5-6600K that's in the build that we have here. Of course, this is a little bit familiar. This is December's PC of the Month, the Epic RGB build. And yes, that was the best name I could come up with at the time. I am sorry. But the other reason why I want to talk about overclocking and how it impacts frame rates in terms of gaming performance is because there are probably a couple of you guys out there who are relatively new to PC building or new to overclocking in general that might still be on the fence of whether or not to go ahead and manually tweak the settings in your system or your BIOS in order to crank up the frequencies on your various components. So hopefully by the end of this video, you guys will feel a little bit less intimidated by overclocking while seeing what kind of performance gains it offers at no extra cost to you. Now, while I'm not touting this video as a guide or a tutorial by any means, it should help you guys understand just how easy it is to overclock your system while also understanding its impact on gaming performance. That said, before we dive in, just a quick little tiny disclaimer. Make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into, the risks involved with overclocking, and how overclocking a component in your system might affect your warranty with the manufacturer. Every manufacturer is different, and there's a number of components from different companies that can be overclocked, but they each have their own set of terms of agreement and operating standards, so make sure that you do your research before actually diving in and tweaking in yourself. So make sure you avoid voiding things that you don't want voided. On that note, let's go ahead and take a quick look at the specs we're rocking here in the RGB build. Go ahead and watch that video, by the way, if you haven't yet. We're rocking an S340 Elite from NZXT. That is the chassis all of this hardware is laid inside of. We've also got an ASUS Z170 Deluxe motherboard rocking a Core i6. Wow. Core i5-6600K on the Skylake platform. That's being cooled by a Kraken X52 240mm liquid AIO. Additionally, we've got 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance LED RAM at 3000 megahertz, a one terabyte Crucial MX200 SSD with Windows 10 and all of our applications loaded up on there. And we've also got, I believe, a 500, no, it's 850 watt power supply. Don't quote me on that, there's a power supply shroud so I can't see it, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's a power supply. Who cares? Yeah. So let's go ahead and reboot the system. We're going to boot into the BIOS this time, and I'm going to give you guys a quick little glimpse at my overclock settings for our 6600K in there. All right, so we're in the BIOS now. We're going to go ahead and jump into advanced mode again. This is the BIOS on the ASUS Z170 Deluxe motherboard, so we're dealing with an ASUS UEFI. It's a very nice little BIOS. Uh, we're going to go into AI Tweaker, so we're going to go ahead and head over to the CPU core ratio, which is by default set to auto. We're going to go ahead and switch that to sync all cores, and that essentially applies the same multiplier to all four of our cores, which is exactly what we want. We want uh, our frequency to run on all four of these cores, not just one of them. So you can see here I've already done some dabbling. I dialed in 47 for our multiplier, and if we go up here in the top left, it shows us what our target frequency is once we boot into the operating system. So right now, with a B clock frequency of 100 and a multiplier of 47, our target frequency is 4700 megahertz, or 4.1, or sorry, 4.7 gigahertz. Then we're gonna have to change the voltage as well. Now our CPU core voltage is by default set to auto. We're gonna switch that to manual 
and you can see I've already dialed in 1.4 volts here, which is the minimum voltage that I found necessary in order to run this chip at 4.7 gigahertz stably. Um, anything less than that, and there was a little bit of uh, instability in certain applications, not all of them, and I'm sure depending on the CPU, uh, the 6600K that you have on hand, you might be able to get away with more, or you might not fare as well, depending on uh, the ASIC quality of that particular chip, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, something to bear in mind with manual mode is that whatever voltage you set in here will run 100% of the time. It doesn't matter if your CPU is under load or just idling, it will run at 1.43 volts 24-7. And that introduces unnecessary heat into your system, and there's no real reason why you need to run at this voltage all the time. So what I would suggest to you guys at home is actually go with offset mode, and what that does, it allows your voltage to scale dynamically with whatever your CPU frequency is. So as soon as you go from load to idle, it'll actually scale down and roll back your frequency as well as your voltage in order to keep them a little bit cooler and more reasonable um, in terms of the voltage that's being sent to your CPU. While configuring your voltage with offset mode can be a little tricky at first, there's plenty of guides and tutorials on how exactly to do that, but for the purpose of this video, just to keep things simple so we can jump right in, we're going to stick to manual mode at 1.43 volts. We're going to go ahead and save our settings, boot into the OS, and run a quick little stability test. So here's a look at our CPU running Prime 95, and just a quick disclaimer, if you are going to be stress testing with P95, I would suggest using a version of 26.6 or earlier, because anything after that is known to produce just extreme, extremely high and unrealistic temperatures. Uh, for, for reasons that go beyond my head right now that I, I can't really remember. But um, I would have loved to use Ada 64, but my free trial ran out and I'm too cheap to buy a license. Anyway, CPU Z right here, 4700 megahertz, right where our target core clock was supposed to be. That's looking good. And our core voltage is going up to 1.44 volts, actually. Um, again, this is a high voltage for you to be running at 24 7, but for the purpose of this video, that'll do just fine. So I think on that note, we've been running this for about five or ten minutes now. It's looking pretty stable. I think we're safe to go ahead, shut this down, um, at least stop the test here, and start overclocking our GTX 1070. All right, so I've got uh, Unigen Heaven 4.0 running in the background here. And we've got MSI Afterburner open, as well as GPU-Z. And just a little background, a little context on the Galax GTX 1070 that we're dealing with here today. Uh, it actually has a boost clock out of the box. It is factory overclocked with a boost clock of 1783. Uh, which is about 100 megahertz higher already than the reference stock speeds of the GTX 1070. But you can see here, um, due to GPU Boost 3.0, we're actually seeing a boost clock of 1923, which is significantly more than uh, what the out-of-the-box spec says, simply because we are well within our power and temperature uh, limits um, that we can set manually. So I'm going to crank these to 100 just so we can continue getting the most out of our boost clock there. And then we're, gonna, we're not going to touch voltage for this video. That's for a topic for another video. Um, we are going to go ahead and tweak our CPU core clock here. So um, our GPU core clock, I should say. Um, I already set this to 130, I believe. And that seems stable. That's anything more than that. I was start, starting to artifact and uh, actually crashing out. And also 375, I believe, was the... No, no, 360. 360. I can just type this in. 360 uh, megahertz on the memory clock was the highest um, clock there that I was able to achieve. Fan speed on auto. We're going to go ahead and save that. You're going to see our boost clock jump up from 1923 to hopefully something more impressive than what you see here. Did I apply that correctly? <laughs> Boom. All right, there it is. So now we're running at uh, just over 2 gigahertz on the GPU core clock and 2181.6 megahertz on the memory clock. Uh, the GPU temp is also going to go up a little bit just because we are running the card a little bit faster now, uh, but still 76 degrees Celsius. Oh, 77. Oh, boy. It's getting warmer. Uh, that's still relatively safe operating temperatures. Again, this is just uh, to see how far we can take this. And it looks like Unigine Heaven 4.0 is still running just fine. I don't see any artifacting from too high of a memory clock or anything like that. So I think at this point, we have our CPU and our GPU clock, our overclocks, running stable. They are set. And I think we should just run some benchmarks comparing uh, results with the fully stocked version of this of this system versus the overclocks that we've just put into place right here. And then we're going to go ahead and circle back, talk about the results, and close this video out with some closing words and conclusions. So on that note, let's fire up the benchmarks and see how our frame rates were affected by our overclocks.
All right, so there you guys have the numbers, and clearly every single game that we tested saw some kind of benefit from simply overclocking our system. Obviously, some games benefited more than others, but at the end of the day, there was still a positive percentage increase in terms of our average frame rate. The overall average percentage increase across all six of those applications was 7.6%. So we saw a 7.6 overall, seven over between seven and eight percent of an increase just from simply tweaking our clock speeds here. Now, while that's all fun and dandy, something to be aware of is that your mileage when overclocking may vary depending on a number of factors. The first of which is ASIC quality. So not all chips are created equal. Some chips whether it be CPU or GPU, overclock better than others. And that's why you see companies like EVGA, for example, with, their, with the last generation of NVIDIA cards, were selling the Kingpin editions of their graphics cards. I believe that was the GTX 980 Ti that they were doing that with. But the Kingpin edition basically promised users a higher ASIC quality chip that would be good at overclocking. Definitely better than something that you would just randomly buy that wasn't advertised as being a great overclocker. That's not to say you can't get lucky and hit the silicon lottery, so to speak. It happens all the time, but it's never a guarantee unless the manufacturer or vendor specifically says it is a bin chip. And granted, again, you will be paying a premium if that is the case. Another contributing factor that helps determine overclocking potential is your cooling situation. So if you have an Intel or AMD stock cooler, you're not gonna be able to get away with the same clock speeds that we hit today. Heat is essentially the arch nemesis of computer hardware. And if you're increasing your clock speeds and your voltages, you're making your system run faster and work harder, which produces more heat. And if you don't have the adequate or proper cooling solutions put into place, then you could run into things like thermal throttling, which is when your hardware actually exceeds its safe operating temperature and thus has to automatically dial back or dial down the clock speed in order to get back into that safe thermal zone. Pushing your system to the limit without proper cooling can also cause your system to shut itself down as a failsafe in order to prevent any kind of physical damage from happening on your hardware. So always make sure you stay cool, stay in school, and don't be a fool. Here we go jump in the pool. But with that said, guys, I think that's